Greetings and welcome to the Richard Dolan Show, where every week we fight the good fight. Happy to be here with you. I hope you forgive the uh, kind of extreme obviousness of the title of my program for uh, this time, uh, which is UFOs did not start in 2004. So you're like, yes, of course, I know that, Richard. And yes, I know that you know that as well. Um, but we have a strange situation that has developed in our society over the last few years. So for the longest time, as many of you know, our government, our military, completely denied any reality to UFOs whatsoever. And then at the end of 2017, the New York Times gave us two articles, two articles in one day that said otherwise. Uh, now, it's one thing when uh, some private researcher like myself or uh, many other people makes this type of a claim that, you know, UFOs are real. We have been making these claims for years, and clearly UFOs are real. And I mean, not just as experimental this or that, but actual anomalous craft that do not make sense in the context of human civilization. Those UFOs, we've been making this claim for a long time. Uh, but when the New York Times does it, well, that's a little different. New York Times is the Pravda of modern America. That is, they are the, the voice of the establishment. Um, although it turned out that the authors of those two articles did have to fight to get those articles in there, but they succeeded. And I'm, I'm glad and uh, probably you're glad they succeeded. Now, one of the articles, of course, mentioned what is now the famous Tic Tac UFO incident of 20, uh, to, excuse me, 2004, a very significant U.S. Navy encounter with a an object described by pilot David Fravor as a Tic Tac shaped object and the, the name stuck. It's not a bad name. It's, why not? Uh, he estimated it about, uh, to be about 40 feet in diameter and that it had just simply incredible performance capabilities that essentially blew away the capabilities of the F-A-18 Super Hornet uh, that was there to investigate. So that's interesting, and it is not surprising that, you know, we would be focusing uh, on this previously unknown case. It is an extraordinary case, deservedly one that commands our attention, particularly since that event has now had, had a number of witnesses who've come out members of the USS Nimitz, members of the USS Princeton have come forward and talked about this. And we have a lot of data, a lot of good information about this. So it is deservedly an excellent UFO case. Um, having said that, you know, the thing is, when you encounter discussions of UFOs or UAP nowadays, so much attention has gone into the Tic Tac encounter um, that what what you see is that uh, the Pentagon is very very happy that that this is the case. I would say, like if they're being forced to talk about UFOs, their goal is to keep all the conversation restricted to the 21st century, and that way they can continue to pretend that this is a new phenomenon to them. There is no history of cover up or conspiracy. This is as new to them as to everyone. Else, and uh, you know, just a couple of months ago, in Congress, we had the uh, the single day, one morning, frankly, of a UAP hearing. Uh, that is the unclassified version. Was just one morning. Uh, these two gentlemen, uh, Scott Bray and Ronald Moultrie, were the two uh, representatives of the Pentagon briefing members of Congress about this phenomenon and. You know, I mean, the things they had to say were, I, I've, I did a whole video on this the day that this came out. Uh, Scott Bray uh, talked about these objects. Uh, they both said this is real. So like a lot of people said, well, that's a great win. That's a great victory. But, you know, the way that they discussed this is, is something that I think we could easily take issue with. So Bray's talking about these things as potentially adversarial platforms with, and potential breakthrough technology. Okay. Fine. Or maybe as U.S. government or commercial platforms. OK. Or allied or partnered systems. OK. Beginning a little less uh, convincing here. 
and then other natural phenomena. Notice he never at once said, oh yeah, well, we think it's extraterrestrial or alien. And Moultrie was basically the same. And uh, his, his statement was my favorite one. He says, well, by, I love the way that these people speak. By combining appropriately structured collected data with rigorous scientific analysis, any object that we encounter can likely, like he said, likely, be isolated, characterized, identified, and if necessary, mitigated. And I'm like, I've said this before, I'm going to say it again. With all due respect, gentlemen, you're not going to mitigate anything here. The United States military has attempted and failed for now more than 80 years to deal with and mitigate this phenomenon, and they have not succeeded. Um, and by the way, uh, you know, I have been I've been now involved in studying UFOs for just about 30 years. I got involved in the early 1990s. And I remember those early 1990s when I began researching UFOs. And all right, so there wasn't much of an internet. That was the baby internet, a couple of news groups, things like that. But there were a lot of books and there had been a lot of research already done. By the time that I became interested, I made it a, a goal of mine to find as many of those books as I could. I found a lot of them. And lo and behold, there is a tremendous amount of research that had already been done on UFOs uh, and a lot of talk about a cover-up and conspiracies and the like. Uh, this is not something that just started in 2004 by no means whatsoever. Unbelievable that we're now in a position in our society where all of the entire 20th century history of this, for the most part, is being overlooked in uh, contemporary discussions of this. Now, again, uh, there are exceptions, but for the most part, it's really kind of amazing. So I want to go through a little bit of the history with you. I'm not, you know, if you followed me in any, in any way over the last many years, you know, I love to talk about the history of this subject. Yes, I do. I don't want to overdo it here, but it's important not to lose sight of a couple of basic things. And I'm just going to run by a couple of key documents, a couple of key sightings that you may not have um, familiarity with. I found a couple of obscure ones and we're going to keep going from there. So this is, of course, one of the more interesting memos. Uh, this is from January 30th. First of 1949, the FBI. Uh, this is the first page of a fairly long memo. And there's a lot of interesting information about that, but this one basically just says this matter that is flying saucers is considered top secret by intelligence officers of both the Army and the Air Forces. It's 1949. They still were in the habit of using the old phrase Air Forces, plural. Uh, continues, it says, during the past two months, Various sightings of unexplained phenomena have been reported in the vicinity of the Atomic Energy Commission installation at Los Alamos. Uh, yeah, it was very si significant. In fact, this memo went on to discuss uh, some of the details of objects that were tracked moving at speeds of 9,000 miles per hour. Uh, really quite significant. Uh, we're talking military units tracking these objects with sophisticated instrumentation, uh, moving in at speeds that we don't even have a chance, not then and barely even now, of achieving some of these speeds. So, you know, quite, quite significant. Uh, the next document I just want to show you very quickly, another one that I've always considered important, this is back in 1950, uh, relating to the Hanford Atomic Energy Commission site that's in the state of Washington, where they manufactured plutonium for many, many years. Uh, apparently, there was a lot of UFO activity going on over that site in 1950. This memo, uh, which was classified at the time, just stated, since July 30th, 1950, objects round in form have been sighted over the Hanford plant. Air Force jets attempted interception with negative results. All units, including the anti-aircraft battalion, radar units, Air Force fighter squadrons and the Federal Bureau of Investigation have been alerted for further observation. The Atomic Energy Commission states that the investigation is ongoing. Another, I've, I've often wondered, how would the world have reacted if that one memo 
that one single memo had been released at the time that it was written. And if the public had an opportunity to just, just to get a glimpse of the reality that was going on beneath the surface of our classified world. Well, I think people in 1950 would have been pretty darn interested in wanting to know more about this. When of course their government, the Air Force and the official government uh, representatives kept telling the public over and over again, there's nothing to this. These are either hoaxes or they are misidentifications of natural phenomena, honest mistakes, or sometimes dishonest mistakes, but there's nothing to worry about people. And that was the message over and over. And it's memos like the one that I just showed you that prove this to be a lie. Uh, and there's so many of those. They go on and on. I'll just show you, I think one more here. Oh yes, one, one of my favorites, uh, perhaps my favorite of the early uh, publicly released UFO documents. Uh, let's call it the Chadwell memo of uh, December 4th, 1952. H. Marshall Chadwell was the director of scientific intelligence for the CIA at the time he wrote this memo, which was to his boss, the director of the CIA, Walter Beetle Smith, a very famous man in his own right. And Chadwell just, he's talking about uh, the density of UFO sightings that had occurred throughout 1952. It was a very, very active year in terms of sightings. And Chadwell writes to his boss, he says, at this time, the reports of incidents convince us that there is something going on which must have immediate attention. Sightings of unexplained objects at great altitudes and traveling at high speeds in the vicinity of major U.S. defense installations are of such nature that they are not attributable to natural phenomena or known types of aerial vehicles. I have probably read that memo in public so many times. I've known it by heart for years. Uh, that's a very powerful statement. And really what you have is a carefully worded document uh, to the head of the CIA about intense UFO activity that had been taking place. And notice he says, not attributable to natural phenomenon or known types of aerial vehicles. And yet these were recorded visually and through instrumentation multiple times. And this was a very significant uh, crisis within the classified world at the time. I've written about this at great length uh, a number of times in several of my books. And it was very, very seriously taken by the upper echelon of the national security state and establishment. Uh, so much so that they essentially uh, disabled Project Blue Book's ability to do genuine investigations of this blue book being the air force's official investigative body of this uh, not that blue book ever had tremendous capability prior to that but after 1952 it was a done deal and blue book was just a shadow of of even what it had been in 52. so a um, couple of uh, significant documents again just to show that when you get these pentagon spokespersons who deny any knowledge of any kind of prior interest by the United States government in this phenomenon, which they do, and to deny that they know anything about it, cover up or God forbid, conspiracy. Uh, you know, the, the basic history has been there for years and years and years. Now I want to uh, run by a couple of early interesting UFO experiences that you probably, uh, some of you may know, some of you may not. This is, uh, Deke Slayton is one of the, the Mercury astronauts. He's one of the original seven Mercury astronauts in the NASA program in the early 60s. Uh, a remarkable Air Force pilot. He had an encounter in um, 1951. I'm going to talk about. Uh, here's a picture of Slayton with the Mercury 7. This is him with the circle around him. He's in the front row, second on the left, uh, along with people like Gordon Cooper and John Glenn. Uh, all, all of these guys were legends, including, including Donald Deke Slayton. So what's his story? So he's flying an F-51 uh, Mustang aircraft uh, near Minneapolis on December 12, 1951. And this is what he says. He's, so he's doing a, a, a maintenance test flight um, on a very, very sunny day with very good weather, so great visibility. He's about 10,000 feet over the, the northern Mississippi River near Prescott, Wisconsin. And then he says, 
this white, he saw this white object at his altitude at one o'clock. So almost right in front of him. He, at first he thinks it's a kite and then he's like, maybe it's a weather balloon, but it seemed a little strange to him. So he decides to circle around. He's like, well, I had enough gas in the tank. I could just do this. Uh, he estimates that it was not huge, maybe three feet in diameter. And then he says, when I came out of the turn and headed straight at it, all of a sudden, it didn't look like a balloon anymore. It looked like a disc on edge. And he actually said in an interview that it was at a 45 degree angle. And this is him in an interview. You can find this uh, on YouTube. Uh, you can listen to him talk about this. He says, then I realized I wasn't closing on the son of a bitch. And F-51 at that time would cruise at 280 miles an hour. But this thing just kept going and climbing at the same time at a 45 degree climb. That's a pretty steep climb, by the way, um, today or in 1951. Not impossible, but rather steep. He said, I kept trying to follow it, but he just left me behind and flat disappeared. Story is not quite over there. So he waited a couple of days uh, and uh, decided, all right, I'm going to have to talk to someone about this. So he talks to a, a full bird colonel who says, <laughs> get your ass over to intelligence in the morning and give them a briefing. So he goes to intelligence, he says, and um, they gave him a fair amount of information. They said, well, as a matter of fact, our information is that there was a weather balloon being flown and being tracked at the time. They said, however, observers both in the air, there was an airborne observer and they had uh, in instrumentation on the ground and they were observing this from the ground. They all saw and tracked another object. The intelligence officer tells Slayton, this object came up uh, beside the balloon. The object appeared to hover. Then it took off like hell. The guys on the ground tracked it with a theodolite. That's very sophisticated tracking uh, uh, equipment. Uh, and they computed its speed at 4,000 miles per hour. And quite remarkable. Uh, when uh, Commander David Fravor stated that the Tic Tac UFO departed when he went to approach it, uh, he said it was out of his visibility range within two seconds. And he said that he had perfect visibility of 10 miles and um, roughly a practical visibility of, of roughly 50 miles. But even with 10 miles disappearing in two seconds, you're talking um, more than 5,000 miles per hour easily. So comparable speeds to what was being tracked way back in 1951 by um, military instrumentation using a theodolite. So I'll tell you, that was an Air Force story. Slayton was in the Air Force. This is a Navy story that I want to give you. Yet another U U.S. Navy UFO story because the Navy has so many of them. This is a picture of Admiral Delmer Farney from the 1950s. Farney was known uh, in the Navy as the father of the guided missile. Um, he was quite involved in that for the Navy. He was a highly, highly prestigious admiral during his career. He was also very much engaged in the UFO matter. A good friend of uh, Major Donald Kehoe, who was the key uh, UFO writer of the 1950s, I would say. And uh, Farney was a board member of NICAP. Uh, that was the National Investigative Committee on Aerial Phenomena, ran by Kehoe from the late 50s. And Farney was a uh, was a friend of Kehoe's. So in uh, January of 1957, Farney gets a, a report from Navy uh, channels about an encounter from 1953. Now, we don't have an exact date. Farney may have had the exact date, but I, we don't, I don't have it. Um, and nor do we have the exact location. But uh, essentially, there was a squadron of carrier-based Navy AD-3s. These are Navy fighter aircraft at the time. They were practicing offshore combat maneuvers. So offshore, uh, I'm going to guess either the southern coast of California or perhaps off of uh, Norfolk in the east mid-Atlantic region. That would be my guess as to where this occurred. We do know both of those regions have had a lot of UFO activity reported recently and also back in the 50s as well. Um, I'm going to guess uh, mid-Atlantic, but uh, 
I don't really know. So here's the, the key part. So Farney learned as the planes reform, they're doing maneuvers, quote, an enormous rocket-shaped machine swooped down over them. Now, rocket shape could be also tic-tac-shaped, cigar shape, a classic description of UFOs over the years. Swoop down over them, swiftly decelerating to their speed. That's impressive. It leveled off a thousand feet above the squadron. So evidently showing definite interest in these guys. The pilots spread out and climbed at full throttle toward the giant spaceship. This is Donald Kehoe's writing, by the way. He liked to use language like that. The huge craft turned sharply, and with a tremendous burst of power, it shot into the sky, vanishing in seconds. Uh, that's not the end of this story. In the aftermath of that encounter, according to what Kehoe learned through Farney. And also NICAP got this exact story uh, a year after Farney got it. So by 1958, uh, members of NICAP got the exact same story. Uh, and what they learned is that three U.S. Air Force intelligence officers flew to the carrier. So this is a Navy incident, but you have Air Force intelligence officers now coming on the scene. Uh, an Air Force colonel took charge. That had to be a bit annoying to Navy personnel got to think, and grills the Navy men. Without consulting the carrier captain, he warned the Navy men to forget what you saw today. You're not to discuss it with anyone, not even among yourselves. Now, uh, what Kehoe wrote is that there was no Navy order uh, commanding these men to silence. It was just this Air Force guy, not that that is meaningless, but eh. There is certainly a lot of rivalry between Navy and Air Force, uh, certainly even more so then, even than now. So there was no Navy order backing up the Air Force colonel. That's uh, why they believe the leak eventually reached Delmer Farney. So, um, yeah, another interesting story, and this goes, that went way back to the 1950s as well. And I would just point out that that one shows not simply a dramatic military encounter with an extraordinary object that essentially is acting like the Tic Tac UFO in 2004, but you've got it not just Deke Slate in 1951, but this Navy encounter in 1953, and there are definitely others. But I wanted to bring out these two, which are not nearly very well known. So, um, you know, it's good to, to hear them. And these are not uh, released through Freedom of Information. That's true. But look, you've got one source is Delmer Farney. One source is uh, a, a Mercury astronaut, Deke Slayton. They're, they're about as prestigious individuals as you want for these types of accounts. So I think we uh, are obligated to take them seriously. And I, for my part, I have no problem believing the truth of them. So they're serious encounters uh, with the United States military. And in the second one, we see a genuine rivalry and probably some high emotions being uh, displayed over this encounter. So again, you've got, you know, fast forward to 2022, the Pentagon hearings, and you've got these two Pentagon spokespersons saying, well, you know, we don't really know what these things are, uh, but we feel that we can mitigate them. Uh, we think maybe they're, you know, an adversarial platform. Like, say what? This this has been going on for a very, very long time. I want to show you another story. This is the Robert Sarbacher um, account. Robert Sarbacher was a brilliant U.S. defense scientist in the 1950s and beyond. He actually was quite famous. He made the cover of a, a couple of magazines as one of these new geniuses being, uh, you know, under employee of the Defense Department. Uh and in 1950, Sarbacher had a meeting with a Canadian uh, government employee who was also an interested UFO researcher named Wilbert Smith. Smith was in D.C. in September of 1950 uh, as part of his government. He's associated with the Canadian embassy at that particular time and had a meeting with, uh, arranged for a meeting with Sarbacher. Smith was hunting down information on UFOs. He found Sarbacher. They had a private conversation. Smith took handwritten notes, which were found years later, on this. And then Smith, in the aftermath, 
typed up a report to his uh, bosses in the Canadian Department of Transportation. What Sarbacher said to Smith was that this matter, this is the matter of flying saucers, UFOs, is the most highly classified subject in the United States government, rating higher even than the hydrogen bomb. In 1950, that would take some doing. The hydrogen bomb was a hugely important uh, project for the United States at that time. Sarbacher also said to Smith, flying saucers exist. Yes, they do. He said their modus operandi, that is how they move, is unknown but a concentrated effort is being made by a small group headed by Dr. Vannevar Bush. For those of you new to this UFO game, no relation to the famous family of the George Bushes, different, a different Bush. Uh, Sarbacher goes on to say the entire matter is considered by the United States government uh, authorities to be of tremendous significance. That goes without saying. He goes on. And now this is in later years over time. Uh, well, in 1950, he still said, all we know is that we didn't make them, and it's pretty certain they didn't originate on the earth. Uh, years later, Sarbacher, uh, after Smith had died, uh, a researcher um, named Arthur Bray went through Smith's papers and found the original notes, found Sarbacher's name connected to all of this conversation, and then uh, other researchers found Sarbacher. Uh, one of them was Stanton Friedman. Uh, Sarbacher, 1983 now, many years later, tells Frieden, and yes, that actually did happen. Yes, I did talk to Wilbert Smith about this subject. And he said, I was told that they had recovered a UFO with some people in it. So he said that to Friedman. Uh, then another UFO researcher of the time named William Steinman really hit a home run with Sarbacher. He had conversations with him and got a two-page type uh, letter from Sarbacher. And, and this, I really want to bring your attention to this. Sarbacher said, John von Neumann was definitely involved. I'm going to talk about Neumann in a moment. Dr. Vannevar Bush was definitely involved. And he said, and I think Dr. Robert Oppenheimer also. And he said, although I had been invited to participate in several discussions associated with the reported recoveries, I could not personally attend the meetings. You got to wonder wh why, <laughs> what, what could be so important, Robert Sarbacher, that you couldn't attend those meetings? He said, I am sure that they would have asked Dr. Uh, Werner von Braun. So he said that in 1980. Now, I want to talk a little bit uh, about John von Neumann, who Sarbacher said was definitely involved. There's a picture of Neumann there. He is... I think universally considered the most brilliant mathematician of the 20th century. And I think by many people, probably most people who, who know such matters, probably as the most powerful intellect of the 20th century. Uh, and maybe as one of the most great, the greatest geniuses of all time. Neu Neumann was that amazing. Uh, all other geniuses who met John von Neumann, I don't think there's a single exception to this. Every one of them was blown away by this man's intellect. He wasn't just a mathematician. He was he was an everything genius. Uh, and, and from what I read, an all-around cool guy to hang out with, too. Uh, he just had it all. <laughs> uh, died way too young. That was the big problem. But Neumann was extremely in demand by the United States government for just about anything of importance you could imagine. And here now, Sarbacher says they got him in for the UFO crash recovery program. That's quite significant to have someone of that stature, world level intellect, uh, one of the greatest geniuses of all time was involved in this. And it's kind of slipped by the boards of most historical research. You don't have many people commenting on this fact or this, let us say, allegation by Robert Sarbacher. It is one that I believe, again, you know, when you look into the details, uh, I would just say of how Sarbacher uh, was found. Uh, this is all by like a, a fascinating little trail of breadcrumbs. It's a it's an incredible story. I've told it many times. I'm not going to go into all the details here, but you know you have basically Smith finding Sarbacher. Smith dies. Um, Smith's handwritten notes are found long after his death. Sarbacher's name is found in those notes. Sarbacher is still alive. Researchers find him, and then Sarbacher actually uh, led them to another man 
uh, Dr. Eric Walker, who is, has his own fascinating connection to all of this. Walker was um, a friend of Dwight Eisenhower, President Eisenhower, former president of Penn State University, but even more importantly than that, ran one of the most important defense um, non-profit uh, um, study groups, uh, the Institute for Defense Analyses for years, very prominent. And Walker had his own series of conversations with researchers about this subject as well, which that we don't have to get into that here, but it's quite fascinating. Um, I do want to mention just Van, Van Bush here for a second uh, that Sarbacher also said was definitely involved in the program. That would make perfect sense. Vannevar Bush uh, wasn't the genius, quite the genius that Von Neumann was. Of course, no one was. But Van Bush was a brilliant man. And more than that, he was what you would call the leading power scientist of the 1940s and 50s. That is, he was the official scientific advisor to Presidents Roosevelt and Truman. So he And he ran all of the powerful uh, wartime uh, research and development projects, including the Manhattan Project. So he was Robert Oppenheimer's boss for that and uh, oversaw the creation of the National Science Foundation, much, much more. Vannevar Bush was a fascinating guy. In fact, originally came up with uh, the concept of the hyperlink that we now use in the internet back in the 1950s before there was an internet. Uh, Vannevar Bush actually talked about this. He was a super brilliant man. And of course, uh, stated as uh, a member of MJ-12, whether or not you believe that uh, if there was an MJ-12, he certainly would have been in it. There's no question. So Sarbacher here, uh, before anyone even talked about MJ-12, is talking about Vannevar Bush. So again, uh, very, very interesting stuff. Oh, back to Sarbacher is one other thing I wanted to mention here. He just, a couple of other statements he made. He said, I did receive some official reports when I was in my office at the Pentagon. So official reports, uh, but all of these were left there at uh, the time and we uh, and we were never supposed to take them out of the office. Yes, that's well understood. He said, I took this assignment as a private contribution. We were called dollar a year men. In other words, <clears throat> men of means who were uh, doing their patriotic duty to, um, help out the government. This was especially during wartime, during the Second World War. They were known as a dollar because they got paid a dollar for uh, their service for a year. Uh, he said then, certain materials reported to have come from flying saucers were extremely light and very tough. This is from his letter to William Steinman. I am certain, I am sure that our laboratories analyze them very carefully. And then the final thing he just said here to Steinman, there were reports that instruments or people operating um, these machines were also of very light weight. I remember in talking with some of the people that I got the impression these aliens were constructed like certain insects. So um, quite interesting indeed. And then the last bit of testimony I'm just gonna uh, leave you with here is that of June Crane. Uh, this is a woman, <clears throat> Uh, she died, uh, I think, more than 20 years ago. She was found and interviewed by uh, the UFO researcher James Clarkson, a really great guy. And James uh, was out in the Seattle area. He talked about this in his books, how he met June and so forth. Uh, she was getting on at the time, and she worked at uh, uh, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in the early 1950s and had a, a great amount of information that she shared with James. He wrote a book about this called Tell My Story. It's very good, strongly recommend it. And uh, she said, look, I didn't see alien bodies, but I heard quite a bit about this being stored at the Aeromed Lab at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. She, and she said this directly, the Aeromed Lab is the one that got the bodies. Uh, the men that she worked with were senior scientists high level people, she said they told her, they, or she overheard talking and she heard them talking, that two little green men were brought in from New Mexico. They were dead, four feet tall, greenish blue in color. She held a piece of metal in her hand that could not be dented, scratched or damaged. After folding or bending it, it returned to its shape. How many times have we heard this story from the Roswell memory metal? And she was told it's a piece of a spaceship and she said, these men were not joking. 
So that's June Crane. And there's audio uh, of June Crane talking. And if you just listen to her speaking, you can see this was a, a person, especially at the end of her life. She she was not throwing out any any uh, stories or any BS or, or anything like that. She was completely on the level. And um, I just want to take this moment to recognize the recent UFO photograph that was released um, a few days ago, uh, a number of really excellent UK researchers, uh, essentially, and really, I think the main one was um, David Clark, who's quite active over in the UK. And he uh, found this man named Craig Lindsay, who was a former Royal Air Force briefing officer. And this has to do with a case that was written about uh, a bit by Nick Pope in Nick's very first book, Open Skies, Closed Minds, very fine book, by the way, um, of a UFO sighting and series of photographs that took place in August, uh, August 4th, 1990, in a little place called Calvine, Scotland, up in the Highlands. It's a fairly remote uh, little town. Uh, so this is him. I'm going to tell the story in a moment. This is the photograph. And uh, thanks to Dave Clark, he was able to get this photograph. It is now in the custody of the Sheffield Hallam University. Uh, this was shown the other day on, on a YouTube program that those gentlemen had. And uh, this is a close-up. This is uh, provided through the uh, banded photo analysis of this. And that's the best quality resolution that I was able to see anywhere. I'm sure there's better that we can get. But uh, essentially the story is you had two men walking in Calvine in um, Scotland. They hear a low humming sound. They see a large diamond shaped object hover. They said for about 10 minutes before it flew off vertically at great speed. That's a very important part of the sighting that I don't think was discussed in um, in that particular uh, program that those guys did, but that's the report. Um, they uh, the witnesses did see a Harrier. Uh, what they saw was a Harrier jet that made a couple of low level passes, and uh, and that appears in the. I'll just show you that picture again. If you go back, you can see the jet behind the object there, right there. So as um, at some point, though, as the jets were there, the object just simply took off. So one of the witnesses had a camera. He had a very good quality camera, uh, according to the photo analyst that did a report on this picture, and sent six photographs, uh, well, according to, to what Nick had written, to the Ministry of Defense. But actually, he sent them to the Scottish Daily Record, not to the MOD. And uh, the way this whole thing happened was, uh, so he sends the pictures to the Ministry of Defense, uh, excuse me, to uh, the Scottish Daily Record. And they contact Craig Lindsay, who was the RAF uh, press officer at the time. And, and according to what Lindsay later said, they were like, well, we want to, we'd like you to comment on this. And he's like, well, I can't comment on it if I don't see any of the pictures. So this is pre-internet capability to do anything like that. So they actually sent a print, a very good quality print, which he was holding in his hand and that other photograph. Um, they sent it to him via courier. And he's like, wow, this is quite fascinating. <laughs> like, this is an amazing picture. So he made three photocopies of it and he sent one of those via fax to the MOD. They were blown away by the picture. And they said, we would like, can you get us the negatives? And he said, well, I'll ask the Scottish Daily Record. He asked, and the Scottish Daily Record was like, yeah, sure, no problem. Here are the negatives. Give it to the MOD. And so the Ministry of Defense has always had those negatives ever since. Uh, it's really quite remarkable. And also the Scottish Daily Record never did a story on this event. So these guys give the pictures to the Daily Record with the idea that this would make the newspaper, and it never did. Uh, instead, it goes to the MOD, where, as, as Nick Pope later said, he said, a picture of that event was in our office. <laughs> like, this was taken very seriously. And indeed, when Craig Lindsay, years later, went and visited the MOD, he said there was a huge poster of that, of one of, one of the six images. 
that was there. So they obviously were taking it quite seriously, despite the fact that they'd never given the public any information about this. The only reason we got any info on this encounter now is due to some seriously good legwork by David Clark and uh, several other, uh, Matthew Isley and a few other gentlemen who really did some seriously good legwork on getting this information and finding Craig Lindsay. Um, he never uh, gave up the photograph that he had. And in fact, uh, Clark said when um, he found Lindsay, Lindsay was like, well, it took you guys 32 years to find me. And uh, he was quite willing to talk. So fascinating case. And again, that's 1990. You have, in this case, UK military clearly engaged and interested in this object. All right. This is this is an old story. And it has been going for decades and decades. And in fact, for an entire human lifetime, this has been going. Now, you know, consider how insane it is that all this activity and so much more has been completely ignored for decades. It's one of those things that when you think about the magnitude of all of this, it's just mind boggling. How, we wonder, could such a thing be possible? How could there be a cover up? What other word can we possibly use here? Or conspiracy, but a cover up in this case, to, to go for so long of, such a, of something so significant for this subject, these objects, this UFO phenomenon to be shoved aside in our society and then subject to such intense ridicule for generations that nearly everyone has run far away from this subject, uh, mostly in sheer terror. Talk about an incredibly successful psychological operation done to the world and especially done to the educated classes. They're the most, I mean, because they're really the, the true target of this psychological operation, this PSYOP. Uh, it's the highly educated people. So this is not a new phenomenon as far as the military is concerned. It is old news. And it has been the subject of intense interest, intense interest, not passing interest. Not, not the kind of thing that makes you scratch your head and say, oh, well, that's interesting, and then you forget about it. No, no, not that. This has been subject to strong emotions within certain circles that follow this subject, including institutional rivalries. And I think that is quite significant, it seems to me. You could say, well, that's all old history. 1950s were a long time ago. Although I'm sure some of you watching were alive in the 1950s and then the rest of us have parents and grandparents who lived through the 1950s. So it wasn't that long ago. Uh, you know, as Tony Soprano used to like to say, let me ask you a question. <laughs> Here's my question. Does the Pentagon have no institutional memory of any of this? Do they have zero institutional memory? Are we to believe uh, these two gentlemen, Mr. Scott Bray and Mr. Ronald Moultrie of the Pentagon, whose job was to brief the United States Congress on UAP, as they now like to call it, all right? The United States Congress, that's supposed to be a big deal. That they have, that these two gentlemen have such of a, how do I put this, a less than amateur understanding of the most basic history of the UFO subject but that they're still selected by the Pentagon as, yeah, you're good enough. We'll send you off to brief members of Congress about all of this, even though you don't know anything. Well, if that's the case, if they don't know anything. And it wouldn't be the first time that the Pentagon blew off members of Congress with lies and deception. Hell, that's what they do every year on one subject or another. That's, uh, you know, and so what happened here was clearly yet another tap dance of the same type of thing. I don't know how much those two men actually know. I mean, maybe they do know a great deal and they're just consciously being deceptive, entirely possible. Or maybe they're just a couple of government bureaucrats who were politically appointed because they're good team players and they uh, won't be expected to, you know, 
rub together too many of those gray cells in their head in the course of doing their job. They'll just do their, it's like, you know, here's your script, just read this and get this thing over with. Maybe that's what this is. So maybe they don't know much. I don't know. I mean, they probably don't know as much as a lot of researchers know, I, but I really have no idea. But that is less important than the fact that the United States military is clearly, obviously, and egregiously not telling the truth when they talk about these UAP or UFOs. Now, you know, when you think about it, and I'm certainly not defending them here, all right, but when you think about the position that they find themselves in, you have to ask, how could they not lie, right? I mean, how can they not continue to lie? They've been doing this a long time. You know, these people have lied to us now for about 80 years. Do you realize how incredible that accomplishment is? It's one thing to have a temporary secret, you know, that you keep from the public for a short while, while you figure out what to do. That's one thing. But this has gone on for a full, long lifetime. Multiple generations have been have been told to ridicule UFOs and not to believe in them in a very strong way for a long time. This hasn't been a moderate little game here. This has been intense, intense debunking, intense ridicule for years and years and years and years. So, and it's not just a scientific matter. This is political, all right? The UFO phenomenon forces us to look at the UFO cover-up and it forces us to ask uncomfortable questions about government lies and cover-ups. And that word, conspiracy, the word you're not supposed to use anymore unless you use it to debunk and then you say conspiracy theory. Uh, but this is a genuine conspiracy. And I tell people, do not be afraid of that word. Conspiracies do happen. They happen all the time. We've lived in a world, history is filled with conspiracies, real ones. It's okay to believe in them. Look for facts, look for evidence, but they happen. It's part of organizational behavior in the world that we live in, frankly. But the problem is that the UFO reality is very, very messy. This is the, this is, it's not just a matter like we have people, I've been one of them who say like, we need disclosure of the UFO reality. Well, yeah, we do. Although lately I've been talking more about exposure than disclosure. I think that's really what we're talking about, but it's a messy reality. All right. It, it involves, deep deception by our government, especially, although not solely the United States government, but definite deception there. But this cover-up is one of the things that has helped to bring a deep level of corruption to the U.S. system, I would say. And, and that says uh, nothing about the gravity of, of who these other beings are. And I'm, I'm going to say this again and again. These objects are being operated by someone or some beings, some intelligence, that is not from here, not from our civilization, however you define here, space or time, maybe not from our planet, maybe not from our time stream, maybe not from our dimension. Okay, those can be up for grabs, but they're not from here. And I suspect they're from another world, from another actual planet. Yes, extraterrestrial. This is what I believe. Now, they may, I think they're living here permanently. Hal Putoff uh, just recently issued a paper about this. I talked about this on my website. It's very interesting where he talks about them as ultra terrestrials, by which I think he meant long-term residents of uh, planet Earth. He didn't rule out extraterrestrials. I suspect he believes in that as well. But they're not from our civilization. That's very important. And as I have pointed out in many other videos, many other articles, especially over at my website, uh, richardolanmembers.com, but also here on this channel, uh, we are dealing with a worldwide phenomenon of these objects being seen every single day around the world, every day, every day. There are certain basic patterns involved in these sightings. Above all, these objects are extremely covert. I would even say clandestine, secret. They are. They don't want to be seen. When people do see them, it is often under conditions of um, some kind of either darkness. A lot of them are at like middle of the night. Uh, 
And in the middle of the night at two in the morning, three in the morning, they might be seen hovering at extremely low altitude over a neighborhood. Uh, particularly those sightings, there's a lot of those. I am uh, especially interested in those accounts. Uh, and there are quite a few of them. What are they doing over your house or your neighbor's house at three in the morning, silently hovering in darkness at an altitude of 100 or 200 feet? That's, you know, these reports are coming in, many of them, and they're easy to find. Go to the National UFO Reporting Center uh, where you can read them. Thing is, we have satellites all around Earth. Many nations, not just the United States, but definitely the United States, uh, especially have the ability to see this activity. Why isn't anyone making that data public? Well, I think the question answers itself because this subject is explosive, right? But here's the thing. We are now moving into an era in which more and more private individuals may get access to technology and to capabilities that will allow them to record some of this activity more and more. And in fact, many of them are recording more and more types of anomalous activity. Uh, I think we're getting to a point in our world in which it's becoming uh, more and more difficult for the dam to hold back the water. And I suspect, I could be wrong here, but I suspect that this is one reason we are seeing a bit more openness and discussion on UFOs or UAP than we have in, the, in our recent past. And that's because it's becoming more and more of a challenge to keep this subject asleep, as it were. The Pentagon will always do everything possible to keep this subject quiet. But I think we have to realize that their abilities to do this is increasingly being challenged by more and more interesting leaks of information, which just keep coming out. Three years ago, the Davis Wilson notes leaked out. And if you were following that matter at the time, you know I was very much involved in that discussion as a strong defender of their authenticity. <clears throat> now, these notes, they were written in 2003 by Dr. Eric Davis. Um, they were very well written notes by Dr. Davis of a discussion he had with a retired Vice Admiral Thomas Wilson. And Wilson related to Davis how he had learned when he was uh, deputy head of intelligence for the Joint Chiefs of Staff in 1997, all right? How he had learned at that time of an extremely secret special access program, black budget program, relating to alien technology reverse engineering. Actually four programs, he had conversation with the gatekeepers of one of those programs and they denied him access to it. Um, he learned a little bit about what this program was, but they said, no, you're not, you're not in. We decide who's in and you're not in. He was angry. He was furious. He complained and he was told, uh, you want to keep complaining, you're going to take an early retirement and lose a couple of stars along the way. If you know it's good for you, you won't complain. And he didn't. He became a team player, got a good job in aerospace after that. And, you know, he had his career. So, uh, but he tells all of this to Davis. Now, the reason... That's important. I was personally shown several pages of those notes in 2006. And in fact, I talked quite a bit about that information many times in public presentations and in interviews for many years in 07, 08, 09, 2010. There's many, many records of me discussing this information. And in fact, I wrote about Thomas Wilson and that encounter in my second volume of UFOs and the National Security State. That was back in 2009 when I wrote that. So I've known about this event for years and years, and yet we had, and we continue to have, so many people in this research field who deny the legitimacy of those notes. Blows my mind. They call it a hoax, or even at one point, it was described as a movie script, which is ridiculous. So fortunately, many researchers do know the truth. And I could tell you behind the scenes privately, a number of people have said to me, oh yes, well, of course I know it's true. Absolutely, we know it's true. But they they can't, they are not, uh, they do not feel that they're at liberty to go public with that knowledge. It's annoying, but it's their decision and I'm not, I'm not gonna out them. But um, anyway, we also know that many researchers uh, have subjected these notes to some detailed analysis. And we've learned quite a bit about the structure of secrecy and the privatization 
of UFO secrecy. So that's the Davis Wilson notes. That's a very interesting thing that came out. More recently, we've had statements by Dr. Hal Puthoff and Dr. Gary Nolan. Uh, he did not Nolan did an interview uh, with Tucker Carlson uh, recently talking about different aspects of this subject, both attesting to the reality of UAP or UFOs or whatever as something not belonging to our civilization. Both of these individuals uh, have certainly not told all that they know. It's obvious. They're clearly trying to be careful, but their statements are clear that it's real and they are here, whoever they are, but they're not us and they're here. And then even more recently, we had the release of the, the remarkable Calvin UFO photograph, uh, which I just showed a moment ago. Uh, again, great detective work. So what I'm saying here is that we're in an era in which information is indeed coming out on this matter of UFOs, showing again and again <clears throat> that UFOs are not only real, but that governments and militaries of the world have known about them since the beginning. They are, they're caught in a very difficult situation. They know that it's becoming harder and harder to maintain the fiction that there are no real UFOs. So they have been working hard to reposition this entire subject in a new way. Let me show you my little final slide or visual here. I'll tell you about that photograph in a second. Uh, but basically rebrand the subject. So from UFO to UAP, we're going to change it. We're going to give it a different a different uh, feel. Uh, we're going to remove all the history from this. So there's no history, no 20th century to this phenomenon. Thank you very much. And uh, therefore remove all hints of a cover-up or a conspiracy. Can't admit that because if you start getting into all the history of this, it becomes very difficult to deny that there is a lifelong conspiracy of silence. This photograph was taken in 1981 from uh, Vancouver Island by a lady named Hannah McRoberts. She was with her family on vacation. She took a picture and you see in the top right, uh, it was an object. She said she didn't notice it at the time. There's a, a inset close up of it. It's a beautiful photograph of an un unknown object. Uh, this negative was subjected to a great amount of analysis by Dr. Richard Haynes of the Jet Propulsion Lab. He's a very excellent UFO researcher. He interviewed the McRoberts family, did a very, very excellent investigation of this. This is a real photograph. And yet another real deal image uh, from over 40 years ago. So, uh, but the whole idea is that this, I just want to leave you with this notion, this reality that the phenomenon has a very intense history all through the 20th century. It's not new. It did not start in 2004 with the Tic Tac encounter. All right. The subject goes deep. It's very deep. It's not a trivial matter. UFOs, UAP, despite everything else going on in the world. And there's a lot going on. Uh, but this is something we do not want to lose sight of. We need to continue to examine this phenomenon this reality. We're dealing with something of extreme technological capability that the United States military has never seemed to be able to deal with. And by the way, this goes for every other military in the world, including the Russians and anyone else. They, they've all had the same experiences with this. No one can deal with these objects. And you might say, well, that's fine. All the militaries are evil and maybe the aliens are nice. Maybe they're more evolved. Well, maybe. All right. Although don't don't get caught up, please, with the idea that progress automatically means nicer and more peaceful. All right. That's a real that's a, a really mistaken idea, I, I would say. Our society, where we now are, is, is more advanced than in, in ancient societies. OK. And it's true. There was a lot of barbarism back then kind of like what we have today in many cases. I mean, maybe some of it's a little different, but let's face it, the last century or more have seen millions and millions of people senselessly murdered and butchered. Well, we have gross injustices that happen in this world every single day, All right? So technological progress does not have to equal ethical improvements, all right? In fact, I would say there's a reasonable chance that one or more of any visiting species that is here 
probably does not subscribe to our stated vision of ethics anyway. They probably, I would say it's quite likely that one or more do not. And I'd like to know why they pervade our world. I've, I've discussed this many times uh, here on this channel uh, recently, so I'll skip it for now, but my goodness, they're everywhere, everywhere. And of course, I continue to communicate with people who have had apparent abductions um, and other close experiences like that. This continues to happen. What are these beings doing? The bottom line is that we as a society are never going to make progress in having an honest discussion about all this until we can force our incredibly rigid and controlling institutions to be honest. Like it or not, they still have a preponderance of power in our world. Uh, you know, in case you forget, we've got a very centralized elite, gl global elite power group right now, and they control our political institutions, they control the intelligence agencies, they control the money, they control the universities, they control the corrupt legacy media, and they control the police. And, and now they control, the uh, via a globally implemented revolution, they have total surveillance over you and everybody that you know. Oh, yes, and they control social media, and they are really, really expert at getting inside your head. So they are formidable. So that means we have to be formidable as well. And the first step in that, seems to me, is to be able to see the truth and to speak the truth as well and as bravely as we can. That means all of us. All of us. That's it. That's what I got for you. Thank you for being here with me. I will be back again soon with more of this. If you like this video, please do like and share it. If you like what I do, subscribe to my channel, get notifications, all that. And if you really like what I do, please check out my website, richardolanmembers.com, where I do this type of thing several times a week. And a big uh, thanks to the chat family. I see you guys. Thank you for that. Thank you for the super chats and for the support. Very much appreciated. With that, let us remember that no matter how challenging our times are, we are stronger and tougher than we think. We can and we will get through this. We can make something better. Let's keep our chin up and remember to keep fighting the good fight. Later. <laughs>